I'm Philippa Tipper and I researched and wrote and directed and performed in the 2020 Bradwell Abbey Mystery Play. I wanted to read you a little bit about mystery plays and miracle cycles. And this is from the York cycle of mystery plays. And this is from the 1951 production, which is when they revived the York mystery cycle. And on the inside, it says, written originally for amateurs, the plays do not demand subtle acting, but rather the direct and simple sincerity born of faith. And it was very much with that in mind that we started exploring what kind of mystery play we could create for 2020 and for Bradwell Abbey. So I've got quite a history with Bradwell Abbey. I've done arts and community and education work in Milton Keynes since 1989. And in fact, the very first project when I came back to Milton Keynes, having done drama and English at university, was a production of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which I created for a group of children in a brand new primary school. A couple of years later, working along with the education unit for Milton Keynes Archaeology Unit, we did the Bradwell Abbey Tales. And that's when nobody was here at Bradwell Abbey. It was really deserted. The, the archaeologists had been and gone and uncovered all sorts of things. And so when I was working with Interaction, we brought a writer in to come and work with the middle school and created the Bradwell Abbey Tales. And it's a, it's a wonderful um, set of stories, Miller's Tale, Baker's Tale, Blacksmith's Tale, which was very much kind of springboarded from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, but their own versions. And exploring the seven deadly sins. And I have to say, as middle school children, they were very into death and killing and lust, which was quite interesting. From that, we spring forward. And then... Um, I have always been interested in the medieval period and The Lateral Village by Sheila Sancha, which is a wonderful set of stories based on the different drawings that are actually in the wonderful illuminated manuscript of The Lateral Psalter. And from that, we've got lots of information about medieval life and this particular village. And I remember age 12 reading Night After Night, which is another book by Sheila Sancho, which has just brought that period to life. And so it's always been my real desire and dream to create something that was going to bring it to life. So fast forward 2020, we're all in this peculiar lockdown. All sorts of things are not happening that should be happening. And then I get a call from Noel, the director here, at City Discovery Centre saying, could we create a mystery play and it would be a live performance? Yes, we could, because they'd also found some incredible things during lockdown and also the year before when I was doing another project, which was the Pilgrim's Trail. So we'd already hooked back in to what was happening here and the fabulous head that had been found, possibly of Queen Eleanor, which I know there's another story about, had been found in the walls. And during lockdown, also bones were found. So very much wanted to bring the, that information about Bradwell Abbey and about the feeling of the place and how it would be buzzing and absolutely humming with activity when it was a huge priory. And if we look at some of the reconstructions, you can see how enormous the site was and the buildings and the amount of people that would have worked here and lived here not just the monks. So in, in looking further at various different medieval mystery plays, you've got wonderful wealth. So you've got your Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and uh, Gawain and the Green Knight. But um, I also looked at Every Man and the Chester Cycle and the Wakefield Cycle. And I'd, a couple of years ago, Wakefield Cathedral hosted a new version of the Wakefield Mysteries, updated. So very current uh, and performed by amateurs with some professionals as well in the cathedral. And that got me thinking, what could we do in Milton Keynes? So I'm really hoping we'll be able to start creating a cycle of stories about Milton Keynes. My first port of call was, apart from doing a lot more research and looking at the excavation of the bones that marvellous Willie Rob created a film of, <laughs> which is, shows how they actually found them and what's there and what's 
the, all the questions, having years of work working with the archaeologists, it just poses questions rather than gives answers. But from that, you can come up with all sorts of stories and you need to be able to create the stories to bring these artefacts alive and to bring a site alive. You have to people it. So uh, first of all, I got a whole load of people who I knew in the area who'd be interested and asked them to come and share some of their experiences. First of all, of the site, I introduced them to the site and talked about it and whether they knew anything or not. And then also their experiences of lockdown. What were they doing differently? How were they exploring things? We came up after that with a series of stories, which was always my aim. Three stories that we could put together with an umbrella arching story with our Bradwell Abbey players invading Bradwell Abbey to perform. It wasn't strictly medieval. We didn't do it in rhyming couplets, but we tried to do a different feel for each story that was there. And the stories were very much about exploring the seven deadly sins, which we were represented with our cloaks, which had not only medieval images, but also 21st century images in there, certainly the coronavirus. And we were telling our own plague stories because a lot of the medieval stories and the, the mystery cycles, they reflected the stories of the, the people that were there uh, and their lifetimes. And I think that I've just got another little bit I want to read. The purpose of the plays was to give in dramatic form a summary of religious instruction from the creation of the world to the last judgment. They were intended to be performed in a medieval manner, open stages, and each play was generally given to a guild. They were the guilds of the various different professions. So there would have been the carpenter's guild, the brewer's guild, and so forth. So uh, I've talked about the York cycle, Wakefield cycle, Chester cycle. These were a set, sets of plays that were very much looking at instructing and informing with the, the good religious background and ethics, um, the, the masses. And the church supported these performances and these plays. And they were quite crude, they were quite rude, they was buffoonery, but there was also gravitas as well. So in creating a, a style and a feel for our 2020 play, I wanted to make sure we were able to bring the fun and the joy and the over-the-top performance, almost, it's almost course acting, but uh, it also links to Commedia dell'arte, which is outdoor performance. It's a beautiful stylized style of performance that comes from Italy with the masks. And I was looking at all of the elements that we needed to put together. So we needed to have the religious instruction or the good morals, looking at behavior and how we can do things, also reflecting what's going on in our current environment and our current situation. It needed to have a really vibrant, big, over-the-top performance style because we were outside. And we knew also our audience was going to be at quite a distance. It would need to be that anyway, because if you're performing outside on a wagon, which we were going to be, and it was traditionally the thing, actually towing wagons around, pageant carts, you perform on the wagon, it's got to be big, it's got to be loud and not too wordy, very visual, and getting the costume right, as well as the posture and performance style. So that's why I looked at Commedia dell'arte and having people like Clive and Bo involved who are trained in physical performance and James who's trained in circus and Tasman who is a BSL interpreter, so wonderfully expressive with her hands. And Yao, who was the most amazing Ghanaian actor, poet, performer. And also Sue White, who is a superb performer and actor. So we had a really lovely mix of performers who were capable of putting a big performance across. Subtlety was not required in this. But in the actual choice of the stories, 
we wanted to look at what had been affecting people. So story number one, the magpie story, the birds. And it very much influenced by uh, the conference of bir the birds um, and poetry from the 13th, 14th century, where you would look at, uh, there would be the birds talking, and in, um, in the Canterbury Tales as well, you have Chanticleer, the, the cockerel, and his many mates, and they speak. So we had the birds, and we were concerned about people at the beginning of lockdown who hoarded and weren't helpful and weren't part of the community, and that became our magpie, which is why magpie came to a sticky end quite literally came to a sticky end. So, you know, not promoting this thing, pr promoting actually you need to share and look after each other. So then we had our little dance of death around him with our plague doctor beak masks that we came and danced around. So it was linking elements from the past and very much our current story. So second story we try to do as quickly as possible from creation to doomsday everything we possibly could remember. That was one of the most important things, to show some of these religious stories. They weren't necessarily accurate, and that's certainly not the case. You know, we, we have wonderful extra stories that are in the other medieval cycles, but it was about entertaining, but making sure that people understood who was good and who was bad, which was fine. So you got God good, devil bad, very clear. And we actually had a heckler demanding that from the audience, because that was the other thing, is trying to get a bit of interaction, which there would have been an awful lot more interaction if we'd had a super live performance and it wasn't just it wasn't for recording uh, purely for recording or live streaming we'd have certainly had an awful lot more banter between the crowd and we could have played with them more because so our heckles for our bird watching uh, our bird watch at the beginning for the story because people could use Bradwell Abbey as a wonderful sanctuary so as I said it was the invasion of us players coming and making a lot of noise and then we moved into lust. We had a lusty story. We let Clive do bits from the Canterbury Tales, bits of Middle English, and he started telling one tale, and then we were, no, we're not doing that one, actually, Clive. That's not what we're doing. But it's nice to have the Middle English in there, which gives that link to what we were doing, and we went into another story, which is, was, could absolutely have been a, a Chaucerian story, because we had, we had lust and desire, and we had uh, purity and we had corrupt abbots and all sorts in there which was which was uh, fun but what we were able to do with that was very much set that within Bradwell Abbey the story and have the pilgrims coming and rope in one of the members of the audience to be one of the the pilgrims arriving and set our own medieval bake-off because we have the medieval ba bakery here and uh, we have the greedy lusty abbot who just wants to eat, 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 eat. And we set a challenge then to make an effigy of the wealthy lady who was going to donate money. And that's how we then ended up with the bread head of Eleanor, which was the, the stone. We don't know if it's the stone head of, of Queen Eleanor. It might well be. It's just the most wonderful find. But it's a superb piece of medieval carving. So it has to be in a story somewhere. And then the other thing, because our wonderful greedy Abbot, of course. We had to have him explode in good Chaucerian style with another wafer thin mint and uh, very Monty Python getting in there as well. And he exploded all over the place and died. And of course, which links then to the bones that were only uncovered recently during lockdown. So trying to make these links with a, a fun story which hopefully brings together, brings to life the characters who would have come and visited here, would have been living here, but also explaining about the chapel and the fact that it was built around this wonderful, miraculous statue that was in the back of the church, a niche. And then to make more money, or as we had it, the wealthy lady donated money to have that chapel built so that the pilgrims had somewhere to go to and the abbey could make more money. Along with that, we needed music. You've got to have music. And uh, we had some wonderful set of musicians who similarly worked with medieval tunes. So we sang some of the oldest tunes. Uh, Summer is coming in. One of the oldest written down tunes that we have archived. And then mixing that with the coffin dance, which has been a 2020 YouTube viral sensation. 
And we have our own medieval version of that that we, we sing and dance to as well. And then we had original pieces as well, which gave told some of the story, gave us the introduction about the pilgrims. I felt it, it, it had a, 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 the right kind of feel, a fun feel, the, but a medieval feel, but getting that information across. My other real inspiration. So this is Marcia Williams, who I adore her work. She takes classics and she distills them into these wonderful storybook versions. And my aim was to try and capture the feel that she creates in these, which you've got all sorts of little asides happening. You've got the, the real story. She works, she's got some of the, the Chaucerian, Middle English, and then their own language and the way that people comment on things. And for me, that's exactly what happens when you do live performance, street theatre, medieval play. And it's about how you can bring that alive and link it with all of these elements from the past. Mm -hmm.